go with me? Go ahead. And go. Okay, so we're switching gears to the next interesting thing utility. We talked about utility maybe the second day of class. What is utility? Something that has utility. Usefulness. You remember that from last time, too. Yeah. Something is useful. Batman has a what? A utility belt. What's in that utility belt? A bunch of gadgets and tools that he can use to do stuff, right? And holding in his gun, right? Is that what you're laughing at, Will? Utility belt holding the gun. Oh, but something is useful, but ultimately I expand that to useful enjoyment, satisfaction, that kind of stuff. How much enjoyment, usefulness, satisfaction we can get out of a product. And we're going to explore that because that ultimately is at the root of our decision making. This is ultimately the root of our decision making of how much higher, how much cheaper does a Coke need to be before we drink a Coke instead of a Pepsi? How much cheaper do plain M&Ms need to be before we decide to eat plain M&Ms instead of peanut M&Ms? You know, that kind of stuff, it's all based on what we're going to be going to here. But ultimately, there's determinants of demand, taste of preferences, income, price of substitutes, price complements, expectations, number of buyers. Those are, yeah, ultimately, what starts leading us down the path of why do we buy some things and reject others. And maybe I'll leave that. Why? Because they're good. You're good. How many of you eat Brussels sprouts? Okay, everybody but Will, why not? Because you're nasty, yes. Yeah, exactly. Just don't. Anyway, so is it, is it, we prefer not to eat things that are nasty, all right? We prefer to eat things that taste good. And all of you just about raise your hand saying, yeah, M&M's, good. So y'all are going to be buying M&M's, right? And is it? Price of M and M's gets cheaper. You can buy more M and M's. If the price of Brussels sprouts gets cheaper, it don't matter because you ain't gonna buy them because they're nasty, right? Well, Brussels sprouts are alright. Oh, he's backpedaling on it. They're all right. <laughs> I, I I made a mistake. I guess I made you eat them. I didn't say I made you like them. Is that, is that what you okay. So, uh. We're just going to take a little trip for a minute or two here, but okay. To do some cross curriculum, whatever stuff with Dr. Gates' class, signatory, y'all know him? Y'all heard of him? Yeah. Um, he talks about we consume things to satisfy our basic drives for security, sex, and ego gratification, making us feel good. Manslaughter's hierarchy, you all remember that in your psychology class. Survival and security, and then enjoyment. If you're thinking about food, eat it to survive, but then why are we not just eating peanut butter jelly sandwiches, or peanut butter sandwiches all day, every day, day after day after day, because all those nuts. All right. We buy food not just for calories, for energy, we buy food for enjoyment and that kind of thing too. Yeah. People say, you know, he says everything's about sex, but uh, I don't know that I go that far. But I've never taken psych class, so I agree. So, sociologists are bringing out that some of our consumption is part of an expression of identity and acceptance for ourselves. Some of the clothes you wear, it ain't just about keeping you warm on a cold day. Some of the clothes you wear are to tell people about you. To tell people about what's important to you. Those, you know, Josie, did you actually go to the school that you're advertising a Cavalier volleyball? So she actually is advertising the school that you actually used to play volleyball for. So she's letting people know, and she admitted earlier she went to the gym and she's like earlier today, and she's in her workout clothes, that kind of stuff. So her wearing her clothes is not just to keep her warm, it's the utility, the usefulness of it's kind of hard to run on a treadmill in a pair of jeans and high heels, right? I would assume. Maybe that, 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 I don't know if you've been on a treadmill today. Or uh, but, and then some of the clothing choices are about letting y'all know she didn't, maybe not consciously. But it's like, people will know she exercises. 
Carry the other guy. Carry. Is that Virginia Tech guy? No. That's a four that. Oh, no, I, can't, I can't read the back side. It, it almost looked like a part of the logo. So, Terry is wearing a hat instead of just wearing a cheap hat. He's wearing a hat that's sort of letting people know he plays golf. Or at least he likes golf balls. <laughs> maybe, maybe he's a collector. I don't know. The other day he was wearing a team tech hat because he's letting people know he's staying sports all right and good in this world. He ain't wearing a UVA hat. The pit of evil. Right. Why are we not just wearing $6 t shirts that we can get at Walmart? When some of y'all were, y'all are doing okay at the moment, but some people you were wearing a thirty dollar t shirt. The only difference is the fact of whatever name that's on the front of it, whatever band, the musical band, the movie logo, whatever that kind of thing is, Suntrop logo, whatever it is, as part of letting people know who you are and what you're about. So there's other reasons that we make these purchases. Some of it is an expression of identity. Some of you people that have a lot of money. Apple has their what, Project Red things where you, instead of getting an $800 iPhone, you can get a $900 iPhone that's like Ferrari Red. And the extra $100 goes to charity kind of thing. So there are people like, you know, I'm supporting charity. I've got the red iPhone. It looks like a Ferrari. I don't know. It's just. There's other reasons why we buy what we buy. It's not all consumption is motivated by ego or status. There's always there's basically the food, clothing, shelter, that survival thing. So it kind of cuts both ways. So Ferrari, yeah, you gotta remember this part of it too, but ultimately there's a lot going into why we buy what we buy. Remember those determinants of demand? Taste and preferences. A lot of that was psychology. Uh, just don't just don't go there yet. Um, a lot of it's psychology. Uh, an example I used in two, 2001 last semester: the idea of there's some people that say that the Sam's Club, Sam's Choice, sort of tastes just like a Coke. And you, you agree with that? Uh, it tastes slightly uh, different. Okay, but just a little, you, you all, you know, like I ain't going down there. You, you get trapped in that. But the, Every year when I start talking about Sam's Choice, Sam's Club Soda, whatever, people, there's a couple of people like, yeah, hey, just like a Coke, just like a Coke. Okay, well, why do people not, okay, it tastes like a Coke. Why do you still see people carrying Coke cans around instead of everybody carrying Sam's Choice can? If it's the same stuff, and Sam's Choice is cheaper. Because maybe there's this kind of thing of, if people see me walking around campus with a Sam's Club can in my hand, they, some people might say, well, gee, that person is really frugal with their money. And I respect that. I'd like to date that person. Or some people might say, uh, that person, they don't have enough money to where they can afford the real soda. Because, hey, in Coke, the real thing. They can't afford the real soda, so they're buying this whatever cheap knockoff soda. So maybe I don't want to date that person. So there is some psychology, so I'm like, okay, well, I, you know, the, even if money is tight or whatever, and well, I don't want to be seen walking around campus with Sam's Club camp soda because I got enough problems as it is repelling women. The last thing I need to do is give them yet another reason to point and run when I come walking into a room. So, okay, I'll mind the name brand soda. Kind of I'm not talking about me in the past 20 so many years ago when I was the elf. So what do you do? You get Sam's Club soda and you take that empty McDonald's cup off the floorboard of your truck and you pour Sam's Club out of the can over there. So then they're going to see you walking around with a McDonald's cup and they're going to say, ooh, he's got enough money that he can stop on his way to campus every morning and get himself a breakfast at McDonald's. He's got some money. I'd like to take that person. No reaction. But there's decision making, thinking going on in there. Middle school kids, what tennis shoes are they buying? Whatever their friends are buying. Whatever their friends are buying. Why? Because you don't want to get your butts kicked and they don't want to get picked on. Whether they like the shoes or not, where are they getting their kids? Whether everybody else is getting it. It ain't about keeping your feet from stepping on rocks, it's about keeping your face from beating knuckles. Right? The middle school kids are just monsters. Oh, oh. But so there's a lot 
logic goes into our mind. Um, that's socio-psychiatric theory. It's, that's telling us why we want good things, but it doesn't tell us what we will actually purchase. There's things that we want that we ain't buying. We'd like a bigger TV better than a smaller TV. How many of y'all got a 70-inch TV in the house? Okay. How many of y'all are stopping at McDonald's every morning for breakfast on your way here? Now, how many of you would like to? Okay. I'm trying to keep my arteries in tow. <laughs> All right, arteries, that's our bridge. I, 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 well, I can't say that. Yeah, I uh, sort of. I halfway expected I was going to have my first coronary incident before I turned 15, but the opportunity is still there because I'm not there yet, but anyway, so ultimately the money is going to come in and start overriding, you know, what we want versus what we can afford, you know, and there may be things that we want, but like we may want our drugs, but we can't afford our drugs because we need our electricity. I don't know. Prices and incomes are just as relevant as a psychological stuff in determining what we're going to buy. Demand is our willingness and ability to buy. We've already seen that before. The individual demand is yeah, the demand of all 320 million of us in America. Your individual demand is for you. David does not have a demand for Brussels sprouts. Haley does not have a demand for Brussels sprouts. Will has a demand for Brussels sprouts. Maybe it ain't a big one, but he demands Brussels sprouts. So like once or twice a year, he eats them. How often? Maybe, maybe, maybe twice a month. It's cool. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Will has a fairly high, strong demand for Brussels sprouts, but the rest of us have been really enough. Because our tastes are different than them. We have taste buds that actually work, where Will, not so much. <laughs> but those tastes could be driving why some people like some things and other people like other things. Some of y'all, the music you listen to is different than other people's. This is a different taste. Some of y'all like some of those movies that just got nominated for Oscars. Some of you are like, I don't think so. Some of y'all watched football games Sunday. Some of you did. We have different tastes, different preferences, different things that we like, right? That's getting partially into the biology of taste buds, but then the psychology of what else is this product going to do for us? Yeah, Sam's Club soda tastes about as good as a Coke, but it scares people away instead of not. So when you have all that psychological stuff there. Income, your incomes are different from each other. I know y'all are college students, so your incomes are mostly zero. Right. Uh, but that's going to change. My wife gets my paycheck, so she's the one that's doing the spending, not me. Um, our expectations are different. Some of y'all are expecting to be graduating here in a couple of months and getting a good paying job. Some of you are expecting to be here for a couple of years. Some of you are expecting for the alien overlords to come and take you back home before the end of the semester. Right. You know who you are. Uh, we have different expectations. And then there's other goods related. Those are the things that are going to be determining as an individual what we're looking for. So, what do businesses try to do to mess with our tastes and preferences? Advertise. Advertise. Oh, well, advertise is number two on the list. It is related to number one. What they try to do is provide utility, provide usefulness, satisfaction, Happiness for the product. They're trying to check that box. Let's check that first one, that taste and preferences. Really check that box. And that's why they constantly, for a lot of products, say new and improved. New and improved. Now, better to make you think I'm getting a better deal now than I was for the same thing that I was buying last week. So I'm willing to buy it. I'm willing to buy more. What do you say? Hey, it's new and improved. The one that kills me is like, yeah. It, especially when it comes to like beauty products, it's really always to drive for improvement, improvement, improvement. And so, I mean, if you've got a, there's a makeup line or something like that that they haven't improved in like a year, everybody has moved on. Makeup is kind of bizarrely bad, like, so the companies are constantly having to improve. And so sometimes they improve by new look and new change the way the bottle looks. But that's okay. It's just all it is is just okay. So you ain't just buying the same of a green bottle. You buying a green bottle with the yellow star, just letting you know something's different. You don't read it. But 
What can we do to enhance the pleasure and satisfaction for the product? Maybe we change something about the product. Maybe we let you know that there's something about the product that you didn't know it did. That's part of advertising. Let you know not only does the product taste good, but you can also use it to clean blood stains off of clothing. Variation to the same product. Yeah, the like exact same, same product. Like WD 40. I think we talked about that one last semester, didn't we? WD 40. How many of you, how many of you know what the WD stands for? Water displacement. Water displacement. He took 201. Well, I knew it before. Oh, good. Because I'm going to answer it the first time, too. <laughs> oh, okay. Good. Water displacement. The point of WD 40 is if you have mechanical stuff that gets water in it, Yes, spray the WD-40 in there and it gets the water out. So then you can use the equipment. How many of us use it to, and the door squeaks. I'm going to use it as a lubricant. I stopped using it. it I don't like WD-40 anymore. It, it, it pits metal, it does. I use all on it. That's what you should use. Because WD-40 is not a good lubricant. It's not, it pits metal. It kind of works, but if you spray your door hinges, guess what? The one month from now, you got to spray it again. Where are 31 oil, you put the oil in there, well, it's going to drip on the carpet. You got to rub or something underneath. But once you get it, it's going to be there for a while. If you don't spray it in your door locks, people do. You spray to put graphite in there, something dry. But anyway, it's just a water lubricant. People use WD. That's what they were to do. Uh, WD-40. We people use it for a hundred different stain remover, getting peanut butter out of people's hair. I don't, there's websites dedicated to all the thousands of uses of WD-40. But it's just a water displacement thing and then people come up with other things. So now they're like, WD-40, it ain't just for water displacement. That's the advertising campaign. Duct tape. How many of you have ever used duct tape? Okay, how many of you have ever used duct tape to tape a duct? I can raise my hand and say yes. Okay, there we go. Say it's a, you can do all sorts of things with duct tape. So even non-HVAC people buy duct tape because duct tape works on more than just ducts, right? That's what you can do. Let the word out. It's more. The product does more than just fixes ducts. It fixes ducts. It fixes cars. It's got light side and dark side. It's just like force. It's the light side and dark side binds the universe together. That's duct tape. They <laughs> <laughs> make everything like they make boats out of it, bridges out of it. They... Yes, it, it's so, it's, so that's kind of you know, the more that you can convince people that the product can do, the more people will buy the product, and the more the people that already buy it will end up buying it. And a lot of that comes through advertising, letting people know hey, did you know that if your kids are cold, you can make them a jacket out of a roll of duct tape? And it'll last them all winter long. You didn't know? Congratulations. So it's code in a roll, right? So the advertising comes into letting you know the utility. Part of that is the satisfaction. How happy am I when I'm using duct tape? Well, I'm happier if I know that the brand of duct tape I'm using is the same brand that Beyonce uses. Because you know that girl's got style and she ain't gonna use anything that ain't stylish. And if it's good enough for Beyonce, it's good enough for me. And hey, that's pretty the only time I can actually use Beyonce and me in the same sentence at the same time, right? People feel good about it. Reinforcing their decision, product purchasing decisions based on the fact that the celebrities in are interested in it, use it, that kind of thing. Too. I mean, that's what a lot of advertising is, but all that psychological because they're like, face it, you know, you see Beyonce using duct tape and you use duct tape, yeah, you could use shock tape her, right? Why, do, why does celebrity endorsements work? It ain't gonna make us, okay, so I'm using the same duct tape as Tom Brady, so I'm gonna be able to do a overtime drive down in the, in the AOC championship. Really. No, it ain't gonna make us a better quarterback because we use the same duct tape as Tom Brady. It ain't gonna make us a better quarterback to use the same shoes as Tom Brady. The same jacket with their gloves as Tom Brady. Or do that TV 12 whatever diet, whatever supplement crap he's got. It ain't gonna make us. Why do we do it? Because using what Beyonce uses, using what Tom Brady uses, makes us feel better than use something that somebody else you don't know uses. Which would you rather use the same duct tape or the same tennis shoes as Tom Brady or the same tennis shoes as your grandpa? Right. Yeah. 
itself. Anyway, so there's a lot going on here, and I've just that's been like a 15 minute introduction. We're really ever kind of where the utility is that pleasure, satisfaction, enjoyment, usefulness that we get out of a product. The more useful it is, the more we're willing to pay for it. And that's just true. The more we enjoy it, the more we're willing to pay for it. How many of you are willing to, I don't know, pay $10 to go? I don't know. No, 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 no. I just, I'll let it go. I, I, I've come up with a bad example, but I can't come up with a good example of going to movies. How many of you pay $10 to watch a two hour movie of two fish swimming around in the burger? Maybe if you're like fully baked on a Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, but how many of you are willing to pay $10 to watch a movie that by watching that movie will raise your IQ by 10 points? Okay, how many of you don't watch that movie a second time? Yeah, I was going to say on repeat. Yeah, so the more usefulness, the more enjoyment, the more whatever we get out of it, the more we're, the more we're willing to buy. How many of you pay $20 for the movie that will boost your IQ at 10 points? Yeah, so the more the usefulness, the more helpful, the more enjoyment we get, the more we're willing to pay, the more often we're willing to buy. So total utility, as can be the total amount of enjoyment and satisfaction we get from our entire consumption of a product, or marginal meant what? Extra. How much extra enjoyment are we going to get by using one more of those items? What is the total enjoyment I get throughout the day if I did? What? How, how much enjoyment are you giving? Who can I pick up? Haley, thank you for volunteering. I didn't volunteer. Check. Okay. Um, Haley. How much enjoyment are you getting out of that bottle of Gatorade? How? A lot. Okay. Uh, how many bottles of Gatorade do you drink in a day? Okay. On a scale of one to ten, how much enjoyment? How much enjoyment are you getting out of that bottle of Gatorade? Okay. She's getting six points worth of enjoyment out of that bottle of Gatorade. Well, okay, after you finish that bottle of Gatorade here in the next few minutes, if you were to like sneak out of class, go down the hallway and buy another Gatorade and be drinking that, how much would you enjoyment would you get out of that second Gatorade today? Yes. On a scale of one to ten, how much? Four. So yeah. She only drank the one. Gatorade, she would get six enjoyment points. That would be her total enjoyment for the day. By going and buying the second Gatorade, that would get her an extra four enjoyment points. So that second bottle of Gatorade has a margin utility of four. And if she drank those two bottles, how much enjoyment would she have total for the day? Ten points. She got six points of joy out of the first bottle, four points of joy out of the second bottle. So by drinking two bottles, she's going to get ten points worth of joy. By stopping at one, she's only gonna have six bottles, six points worth of joy. If she didn't buy a Gatorade today, she would get zero bottles worth of joy out of drinking the Gatorade. Because they ain't doing nothing for her when it's sitting in the drink machine down the hallway. So that's the concept here in a nutshell. Total utility is a total amount of satisfaction from all the Gatorade. That she, how much satisfaction and enjoyment is Haley gonna get for drinking Gatorade today? All total. And then the marshal was like, well, if I drink another one, is it going to add to my enjoyment or not? Well, she, we determined it's going to, drinking the second one is going to add in her enjoyment. Maybe not a whole lot, but it's going to add to it. Maybe drinking the third one, maybe it'll add to it. Maybe it'll make her sick when she starts going up, and that would actually take away from her enjoyment for the day. So that's going to directly impact her thinking about, am I going to buy a second Gatorade? After she finishes that one, she's going to ask herself, how much did, am I going to enjoy that second one? Am I going to get, what do they want for them down there at Buck 50? Good snack machine. I want something. Deodorant. Wait a second. 
let's say a buck fifteen. She's gonna ask, am I gonna get a dollar fifteen worth of enjoyment out of the second bottle of Gatorade? Yes, so. If she's got a dollar fifteen a wallet, maybe she buys it. If not, no. Mathematically, marginal is a change in total divided by a change in quantity, but this is the definition you will see in the textbook that none of you have, none of you will read. But I usually think of this in the other direction. In order to do this calculation, you gotta know the total utility and then work your way backwards. We don't think that way. Haley doesn't think, well, if I drink two bottles of Gatorade, I'm gonna get 10 points of enjoyment, right? She starts, well, she comes at it the marginal way, which is what I'm gonna do. She's like, if I don't drink any Gatorade, I'm not gonna get any enjoyment. If I drink one, I'm gonna get a good amount of enjoyment. If I drink two, I'm gonna get even more. But then she's gonna be like, after I drink the first one, how much am I gonna enjoy the second one? After I drink the second one, how much am I gonna enjoy the third one? After you eat that 15 slice of pizza at the buffet, am I gonna enjoy that 16 slice? So we make those decisions. So, generally, on a test, on the homework, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you the marginal numbers and have us figure out the total. Because that's the way we, as individuals, think. So, oranges. Who can I pick on? Matthew. Okay. Matthew. Anyway. Try to come up with some kind of a So, oh, so, Matt, if he eats zero oranges, how much enjoyment and usefulness and whatever is an orange is going to give him for the day? Zero. Absolutely zero. But if he eats one orange, he's going to get 20 enjoyment points. And you'd be like, uh, did he Yeah. We don't assign enjoyment points. Yeah, I'll put Haley on that. Okay, well, on a scale of 1 to 10. Maybe for her, scale of 1 to 10. Maybe for her, some of you might think I'll scale of 1 to 100. Some of you on scale of 1 to 30. It don't matter. But just sort of, if we could hypothetically put some kind of point system on our enjoyment. The math, the math is going to end up being simple. I'm going to show you the quote unquote hard way to do it. It ain't very hard, but then I'm going to show you the easy way to do this. Well, in a little while, there's a hard, easy way. Not very good. Um, but don't get lost in math. Because guess what? You actually do do this thing. You don't actually consciously say, yeah, I'm going to get 20 points worth of enjoyment out of that orange. You think of it, I'm going to get a bunch of enjoyment out of that orange. Or, I'm not going to enjoy that orange very much. Those are the terms that the backside of your brain is putting on it, but in some way, you're putting points on there. How many of you like plain m &Ls? Most of you. How many of you like peanut m &Ls? Most of you. How many of you have a favorite between the two? Okay, some of you. So some of you, the amount of enjoyment you get out of peanut versus plain is the same. For some of you, you've already determined the enjoyment of one is a little bit higher than the enjoyment of the other. You've kind of already done that. Well, some of you are like, well, the enjoyment is basically the same. So you've already done it. You sort of kind of figured it out. Maybe I like peanut m and just a little bit more than plain m and I love the plain ones. I love the peanut ones. You know? You know, if it comes to every tie, I'll grab, go ahead more often. I'll take the peanut ones over the plain ones. You kind of do this thinking in your head. So don't worry about where the numbers come from at this point. Just know somewhere in the recess of your mind, you actually do this. Trust me, you will by the time we're done with this chapter Thursday. So if Matthew eating that first orange, you're going to give him 20 enjoyment points. If he only eats that one orange for the day, how much enjoyment is the orange he's going to bring in his life? Just 20 points. If Matthew finishes eating that first orange, chucks the meals in the trash can, or compost pile, or garbage disposal. And then he's like, you know, that orange is pretty good. I think I'll get a second one. But as we already talked about, is he going to enjoy the second one as much as the first one? No. So if he eats the second one, that's going to give him 12 more points of joy. So if he eats that second one, how much enjoyment would he have gotten out of oranges for that? He'd be up to 32 enjoyment points. Why stop there? Well, the third one, 
Okay, Maggie needs the third one. That's going to get him up to 35. Is 35 better than 30? 32? Let's get back. Yeah. Is 32 better than 20? Yeah. So what should Maggie do? The more oranges I eat, the happier I become. I should keep eating oranges, right? Because more happiness is better than less happiness. Until, well, what happens here? Orange number four does nothing for him. It doesn't bring him happiness. It brings him a little extra vitamin C and a few extra calories, but it makes his stomach just a little bit. So he's kind of like the extra little mm for the vitamin C and extra little mm of the stomach kind of cancels out. Eating that fourth orange is going to really do nothing for him. So he would stay at 35 points after eating that fourth orange. Then what would happen if he ate the fifth one? His stomach starts getting a little bit squirrely. Not too bad. Just a little bit. So what happens to his enjoyment? It drops down to 31. So he's not as happy eating five oranges as he would have been if he would have stopped at two or three. Right? And then what happens if he eats the sixth orange? He's throwing up. Right? He's throwing up, but guess what? He still ultimately is one point better than he would have been if he didn't eat any of it because a little bit of that vitamin C is going to stay in the system. What little bit did the stomach absorb before he started going up? Right? So, does that make sense to you? So, if money was not an issue and your name was Matt, how many oranges should you eat? Three. How many of you agree with that? Three. That's correct. Because are you going to want to eat something that's going to really knock down your amount of enjoyment in the day? Not really. What level of oranges are going to bring you the same amount of satisfaction eating three or four? Matthew, if oranges was it, Matthew would never be happier than if he was to eat three or four oranges. Eating less than three, he's less happy. Eating more than four, he's less happy. He should eat three or four. But then, if the fourth one is doing nothing for him, he still would be investing the time of the couple of minutes to eat that fourth orange is doing him no good, so would he eat that fourth one? No. So if money wasn't an issue, Matthew would eat three oranges. There's no need to eat any more than that. Okay. Three oranges, it's as happy as he could be. If Matt's last name was Gates, he'd eat three oranges a day. Boom. He can afford it. And that'll get him the most happiness that he can get out of oranges. Go with me. Did I shock you yet? No, because I left the electrodes in my office. And I think, yes, okay. For those of you that can't read my handwriting, there you go. Remember the diminishing marginal utility for a couple weeks ago, shrinking extra enjoyment. We see eating that second orange, Matthew got his total enjoyment for the day was higher, but that extra second orange didn't give him as much happiness as the first one did. The third one didn't give him as much happiness as the second one did. The fourth one didn't give him as much as the third one did. Fifth one took away. So those utility numbers would decline. Like Haley, she got six points of enjoyment out of that first bottle of Gatorade. She only got four points out of the second one. That's just where we are. And Haley, how would you feel if you drank three Gatorades in the day? You're kind of a little waterlogged and like not so great. Going to the bathroom a lot and voice is joy in that. I'm going to spend, how do you drink three Gatorades? I spend half my evening in the bathroom. Scar. Yeah. Not unless you got 70 inch TV in the bathroom. Just don't do that. Unless you last one to see. Generally, as long as that marginal utility is a positive number, then your total enjoyment is going to keep going up as you keep consuming more. That's just for you math people, what we kind of do. So 
saw that already. Yep. Even if you only get three points of yeah, that first orange got met 20 points of enjoyment, the third one only got three points. It's still three points better than you would have gotten if you did you. Um I offer Matthew a penny. He's like, it's gonna be penny, but it's gonna be penny more than he had before, right? Might not be exciting, but he's still better off, right? Uh, I think you know, sometimes I do this. You, I, I'll do, do a little trade here. Man, you, you give me a, you give me a quarter, and I give you a dollar. You like that trade? Really? I think he needs to think about you one all over again. Okay, uh, he gives me a quarter, I give him a dollar. He's gonna make that trade, say you got another one, and then I say, okay, next deal, you give me fifty cents, and I give you a dollar. You gonna do that one? Yeah, it ain't as good of a deal, but then you still gonna be better off. Yeah, you still want, okay. Trade number three. You give me seventy-five cents, I give you a dollar. Yeah. Trade number four. You give me ninety cents, I give you a dollar. Yeah, you do that all day. Trade number five. You give me ninety-nine cents, I give you a dollar. It ain't very exciting, but by doing that trade, you can end up a penny richer than you were before, right? And you can also get as much money as you can. Okay, trade number six. You give me a dollar, I give you a dollar. What's the point? Unless, you know, the, the dollar bill that I have has a better partner hand than the dollar bill you have or something like that. Hey, you don't play dollar partner anymore. You look at me. If you, have, have you ever done it? You just look at the little eight-digit serial number on there and you try to figure out, you know, how many pairs, how many threes of kinds, full houses, and that kind of stuff. And you compare it to somebody else. If you're really hardcore about it, whoever's got the better partner hand wins against the other dollar. Dollars good to play cards. I mean, you can, but this is something else you can do. Uh, but anyway. I don't have a dollar bill in my wallet, so I can't like challenge anybody. Okay, so otherwise, so there's no point in doing that next trade. So if you give me a dollar, I give you a dollar. Well, you know, for that sixth trade, well, there's even a chance that we're going to get a paper cut exchange in the dollars or something. It just ain't worth it because there's no benefit. But even if you make a penny, penny ain't exciting. A penny saved is penny earned, right? Or is it a penny saved is penny? But uh, you would keep going until you got in. Matthew, keep doing trades with me until he got the best, most money out of me that he could get. He should keep eating oranges until he gets the most enjoyment out of oranges he can get. The most enjoyment, the most usefulness, the most whatever. That's the thinking there. So. Okay, I don't know why I put this here. We saw this in chapter three, the idea that the tastes, they're telling me, those tastes are going to tell us how much we desire a product, but then the price is going to tell us how much we buy. Okay. We know that Matthew gets 20 points worth of enjoyment out of a first orange, 12 out of the second one, 3 out of the third one. We know he's never happier than, he would never be happier than he would be if he ate three oranges. But Matt doesn't have much money. And if oranges are selling for $20 a piece, is he going to be eating three oranges? No. He's going to be asking himself, am I going to get $20 worth of enjoyment out of that first orange? Let's just assume, yeah. But is he going to get to 20? Would he be willing to pay $20 to get an orange? Is he going to give him 20 enjoyment points? Maybe. Is he going to be willing to pay $20 for an orange that's only going to give him three enjoyment points? No. So somewhere along the line, that price is going to be doing that stopping point. How much enjoyment are you going to get? Is it you getting a dollar's worth of enjoyment? So guess what? Somewhere along the line, you put a price tag on enjoyment. So, example, here's a new example. Who, who, who can I pick on that? Connor, thank you. That's right, that's when you don't make eye contact. Stuck in your head when I'm looking for volunteer. That's just okay. so. Connor, when it comes to soda, we have done our research. One soda is going to make him 25 points worth of happy. If he only drinks one a day, he's gonna, how happy is he going to be that day? 25. If he drinks two sodas a day, how happy would he be for the day? He'd be up 45. If he drank a third soda, if he drank three sodas a day, he would. How much soda enjoyment would he have? So, 57. If he drank four sodas a day, he would be 62 points worth of happy. If he drank five sodas, he would still be 62 points worth of happy. 
if he drank six sodas, he would only be 42 points worth of heavy. Is Connor ever going to drink five or more sodas? No. Even if they were free, especially if you got to pay money, he is not knowingly going to drink more than five sodas. Matt is never knowingly going to buy eat more than three oranges because he knows that he could. He knows that that fourth one is going to start taking away from his enjoyment. So he's so his demand, Connor's demand for sodas is somewhere between zero and four. He's never going to go beyond five. He's never going to go five or beyond because he ain't going to waste money, right? Waste this money is harder money to get something that's going to do absolutely nothing for him, or get something that's going to take enjoyment away from him for the day. Crap. What else can he buy instead of a fifth soda? Just about anything that will get him any enjoyment. He can get an orange and get him three points of joy. Well, that's better than zero, right? So four sodas and an orange instead of five sodas. Right. So those are the numbers for Connor for soda. Y'all got it? No, we'll be doing that on the over. Okay, that's just so you can keep up with it. So <clears throat> the other thing we consider for Connor is pizza. Connor likes pizza. Good for you. So if Connor was to go and eat one slice of pizza, how much enjoyment would he get? He would only have 35 points worth of smile on his face when he walked out of the restaurant. If he ate two slices, how much enjoyment would he have? 65. Three slices would give him a total of 85. Oh, four slices. Thank you. 100. The fifth slice will get him up to 110. The sixth slice keeps him at 110. So what would happen? Connor would only eat up to five slices of pizza. So if Connor had money, what would Connor do? He would drink four sodas and he would eat five pizzas, five slices of pizza, right? Because he would never be happier than eating five slices of pizza and drinking four sodas. Let's let, now let's just be stupid and assume those are the only two products out there, okay? Just keep it simple here. So if all he can do is buy pizzas and drink sodas, the happiest he would be is by drinking four sodas a day and eating five slices of pizza a day. Anything less than that, he ain't as happy as he could be. And remember in the chapter one through three review, we talked about why is he here to maximize his enjoyment. He wants to get as much happiness as he can. Eating five pizzas and four sodas is going to get him as happy as he can be, given this world of only pizzas and sodas. And he was a college student, so that's a very reasonable possibility. No need to read my handwriting, though. Yeah, with me? Okay, so. We already talked about getting that baby. The higher the marginal utility that product gives, the more we're willing to pay for it. How much are you willing to pay for something that's going to give you 10 enjoyment points? Don't know. Would you pay as much for something that's going to give you 10 points as you would something that's only going to give you five? If something's going to give me 10, I'm willing to pay more for something that gives me 10 than I would for something that gives me 5. I'm willing to pay more for something to give me 20 than for something that gives me 10. So then the question comes down to you start equating those enjoyment points with money. How much do I have to pay? As that margin utility goes down, so does our willingness to pay. Haley isn't willing to pay as much for that second bottle of Gatorade as she would the first one. Uh, Connor isn't willing to pay as much for that fifth slice of pizza as he was that first one. Because that first one got him 35 points for the joy, and the last one only got him like 10. So he ain't willing to pay as much for a 10 slice as he is a 35 slice. Does that make sense to you? So, the idea is you compare the anticipated. Anticipated, you don't know. Because guess what? Your enjoyment changes. How much enjoyment Connor's going to get out of a soda today when the temperature's 15 degrees is different than the amount of enjoyment that Connor's going to get out of a soda in July when the temperature is 95 degrees. Right? These things change as the year goes through. 
these things change as the day goes through. These things change based on how many of those special brownies that Matthew eats at that very other eats in the afternoon. Yeah. If he's been eating some of them special brownies and the pizza that he's gonna have like cheese and for you, we're gonna eat brownies. Y'all aren't familiar with the special brownies. Okay. And don't we all be going, oh yeah, it's Hale's fool, he's really into drugs out there. No. Can y'all imagine me on drugs out there? Jeez. Okay, so um, ultimately what we need to do is find a product that's going to give us the most extra utility per dollar. So let's run an example. What, we, what we're going to do, and this is where we're going to get to the meat of the homework. You've already done half of the homework in this chapter. We've already done the math work, but we're going to pull it together. This is where we get to the easy way and the hard way. We want to figure out the optimal consumption. The ideal perfect thing for Connor is five pizzas and four sodas. But if Connor is financially limited, well, he's got to figure out, well, what's the right combination of sodas and pizzas for me to buy to get me the most enjoyment I can out of that limited amount of money. That's what we're going to be shooting for here. This is the numbers that we have. So, go over that. I'm going to show you the hard way. Then, and it ain't that hard, but then I'm going to show you the easy one. Let us assume, okay, I already said that money wasn't important, you need buy five, four sodas and five pizzas. But let's assume, Connor, that pizzas were a, do a, a dollar slice, sodas are a dollar a bottle. Okay? And so, Connor looks in his wallet and he's got six dollars. He can't buy four sodas and five pizzas because that would take him nine dollars to. Right? He can only buy six items. Nine would give him the most joy possible. So he's got to look at what are the different combinations of enjoyment that he can do. Spending less than six dollars, he won't get as much enjoyment. Right? But spending all his six dollars, he can do what? He could buy nothing but pizza. He could buy one soda and only five slices. He could buy two sodas and four slices. He could get three sodas and three slices, four sodas and two slices, five sodas and one slice, or drink nothing but six sodas. Those are those possible combinations there. So what do you gotta do? The hard way, the hard way is to go back and start looking. Okay, if he drinks one soda and five pizzas, he gets 25 points of enjoyment out of the sodas and 110 points worth of enjoyment out of the pizzas. That combination will give him 135 points worth of enjoyment. Right? Or he could. Microsoft, we drop in every day to remind you to call your software. Uh, okay. Another possibility. Well, what if he drinks two sodas? Well, then he could only eat four slices. Well, that would be 100 points worth of pizza satisfaction, 45 points worth of soda satisfaction. That's better. That puts him up to 155, right? So maybe he should give up that fifth slice of pizza in order to get a second soda. And it, so what you have to do is you got to sit there and look at, well, okay, what happens if he does three pizzas and three sodas? Four pizzas, or two pizzas and four sodas, right. And you end up with these numbers here. If you trust me, you can go back and look at those. And get so if he does zero soda, nothing but six slices of pizza, he gets 110 points. By giving up one slice of pizza to get one soda, he moves from 110 up to 135. If he gives up a second slice in order to get a second soda, he moves up to 145. The third one, well, that's going to go into 33. That's going to drop him down to 142. If he keeps drinking more soda, he drops down to 127, 97, all the way down to 42. So, what should he do? He should do this. That combination, oh, there's supposed to be an error there. It didn't show up. That's supposed to be there. Oh, uh, we got lost in the conversion. No combination of six dollars spending will give him more happiness and enjoyment than drinking two sodas and four slices of pizza. 
You with me? Is that difficult? No. It's just like labor intensive. It's labor intensive, which is why I'm going to show you the easy way. And if you will give me, I might not go one minute over. It's an easy way to do this. Metaphor, just hypothetically, spend the dollars one dollar at a time. He's got six dollars to spend. What will give him more enjoyment? Soda number one or pizza number one? So he spends the first dollar here. Dollar number one. Now what will give him more enjoyment? A second slice of pizza or that first soda? So that's dollar number two. What's going to give him more enjoyment? The third slice of pizza or the first soda? There goes slice number three, uh, dollar number three. So now what's going to give him more enjoyment? Well, there goes dollar number four and dollar number five, right? And now where's dollar number six? Slice number five, slice number four. So boom, there you go. We just spent our six dollars and we bought four pizzas, two sodas. That's the easy way. That's the way you do it on homework and on the test. The nice thing by doing it, spending it, quote unquote, spending it one dollar at a time is, well, what if Connor has, he took his six dollars, he spent his six dollars and he, Went home and he drank his two sodas and ate his four slices of pizza, and then he looks at the couch cushions and he finds another dollar. Well, he got to go sit there and start recomputing all those different calculations and all that kind of crap again. What you got to do? I got another dollar. Boom. Right. And so there will be questions on the homework, questions on the test. How much enjoyment would he get? Or if, if he only had $3. How many pizzas and soda should he buy? If he only had five dollars, how many pizzas and soda should he buy? If he had eight dollars, how many pizzas and soda should he buy? And you just keep checking them down, checking them down, checking them down, until you work your way to the bottom of the list. That's the easy way to do it. And you do this kind of stuff all the time. Somewhere along the line, Connor knows he he likes soda, he likes pizza, he likes pizza a little bit more than soda. Because he gets more enjoyment out of the first slice of soda than that first pizza. Dude, he gets more enjoyment out of the first pizza than he does the first soda, and he is willing to drink more or eat more pizza before he calls it quits than he is willing to drink soda before he calls it quits. Right? So we can see his demand for pizza is going to be bigger than his demand for soda. We know he likes pizza better than the other, but he gets to the point where, yeah, I like pizza, but after I've eaten a bunch of slices of pizza, my mouth's going to be dry. I need something to drink to go along with it. Right? We do this kind of thinking all the time. You like peanut M&Ms better than regular M&Ms, but after you've already eaten three packs of peanut M&Ms in the day, guess what? You get more enjoyment out of plain pack number one than you will peanut pack number four for the day. You do this all in your head every day. Every time you stand in front of the snack machine, every time you go into McDonald's and stand at a value meal, you do this kind of thing. When you're considering chicken nuggets versus Big Mac, you're doing this kind of thing. How many chicken nuggets have I had in the last month? How many Big Macs have I had in the last month? How many enjoyment am I, how much enjoyment am I going to get out of eating the next one, one or the other? Sometimes you go one way, sometimes you go the other. Go with me? Okay. I will stop there and I will see you on the